the whole story about what goes on with the brain, which is what I'm going to uh, emphasize today, uh, started in 1959 at the University of Kansas, where biologists uh, in the animal science department, they uh, work on all kinds of animals. And they, in this case, they were starting with the female guinea pig. And they showed that if you treat female guinea pigs with testosterone while they're developing in utero, before birth, that later on, when these females grow up, their sexual behavior is like that of a male. And that's the result of just giving testosterone before birth, none after. So this was mind blowing. This was showing that the brain was being changed uh, uh, by the hormones administered before birth. And then later, after puberty, when the uh, brain systems were activated, this individual now displayed male-like sexual behavior. Well, the biologists uh, understood how uh, uh, important this, uh, these findings were. But when they wrote up the paper, they showed a little deference to uh, John Money, because all the people in the field kind of knew each other back then. And they, were, uh, they failed to link their animal findings to the human situation. Milton Diamond was a young grad student in the lab at the time. He didn't like that. Uh, he felt that uh, you know, there was no reason to be so cautious. And uh, he went to his advisor, said, I want to write an essay to challenge John Money's theory. The advisor said, OK, go ahead and do it. This was an amazing thing, because Milton Diamond was just a grad student. And he's challenging an icon who was already established at John Hopkins uh, uh, University, a very prestigious medical uh, uh, establishment. Um, and so anyway, he did wind up uh, publishing his essay in the Quarterly Review of Biology. It was a great essay. It would be good even by today's standards, even though it was written so long ago. A uh, very holistic paper. And he did a great job of dismantling uh, John Money's uh, theory. But Money was already established, and Milton Diamond was nobody. So nobody paid attention to this. And in 1972, Money responds to Diamond's challenge, sort of, by timing the release of his book and his talk at the AAAS uh, to um, uh, deliver his news about the twins case, the David Reimer story. So I'm going to tell you about this. This was the perfect nature nurture experiment that you couldn't otherwise do in people. What happened was we have identical twin boys. One boy's penis is, is uh, destroyed in a circumcision accident. The distraught parents go to John Money. John Money says, oh, no problem. We'll just uh, make him look like a girl. You will lie to him, tell him he was, raised, he was born a girl. He will raise him as a girl. And uh, he will be a girl. He won't know any better. And uh, he will learn to be a girl and a woman. And everything will be just fine. And so John uh, uh, becomes Joan. And this was called the John Joan case in the medical literature. And over the years, John Money was supposed to be following these boys. And uh, they did. But uh, what they were reporting to the world was not actually what was going on. Um, and and the, and the medical people were very impressed with this story because this was the perfect nature-nurture experiment. We have identical twins with the same nature, but they're being raised as different sexes, so the nurturing was different. Um, and if, in fact, uh, this, this person winds up being a happy girl and woman, this would be support for John Money's idea. Uh, and because John Money was telling everybody that this was a big success, uh, this nature over nurture case became the foundation of the standard of care for intersex conditions, micropenis, penile uh, accidents, and so on. So here is uh, John, or Brenda, as they called him in real life, uh, after the surgery growing up. Don't be surprised, I mean, don't be misled by the smiles. Um, he's posing for the camera. This is just uh, shortly after being given estrogen. Uh, uh, at the age that people would ordinarily go through puberty to simulate a female puberty. And this is when things really got bad. The breast development really bothered Brenda at the time. And Brenda started putting a lot of weight on to hide the breasts and uh, did not have a happy childhood. Never felt like a girl. Was teased by the kids called animal because Brenda kind of looked like a boy. You know, picture of a typical boy, put a typical boy in a dress and send him out to play. What would he look like? That's what this kid looked like. And at 14, Brenda becomes David. Joan becomes uh, John again. Uh, bec all on his own, without knowing that he was lied to, without knowing that he was actually born a boy, he decides to be a boy and takes the name of David. 
And after doing this, the father breaks down and tells him the truth. And when uh, he hears the truth, uh, David says, all of a sudden, everything clicked. For the first time, things made sense, and I understood who I was. So here is David now trying to live his life as a man, going to the, the wedding. That's where he sort of came out as a man. And he did the best he could to live a normal life. He went through surgery to try to give him some f male physicality. He married a woman who already had children. Uh, he really tried hard. And little did he know that all this time, John Money was still telling the world that this experiment was a big success and that uh, Brenda was a happy girl and woman. But of course, Brenda is now David. And then uh, Milton Diamond conveniently claims that uh, he lost track of uh, Brenda, of John Joan. Uh, how odd he lost track because Milton Diamond didn't. Now Milton Diamond all these years had to be think, wondering what the heck was going on because the animal work kept coming in showing that the organization activation mechanism was true uh, and he was, uh, Milton Diamond, looking at the intersex people who were having all this surgery done on them in infancy to give them conventional looking genitalia because John Money said that that's what you needed to do and you need to lie to these people and not tell them the truth in order for this to work. We have a lot of intersex people running around right now who don't even know they're intersex because of all this. Anyway, to make a long story short, when Milton Diamond finally found David and told David what had been going on and how all these intersex people had been getting operated on and made to look in a way that doesn't uh, match the way they feel about themselves, he decided to uh, go public, and he did. And uh, that was the beginning of the end for John Money. Now, meanwhile, let's look at the intersex people, many of whom were being operated on because of John Money's theory. And this is Curtis Hinkle. He's the founder of the organization uh, uh, Intersex International online. Really, the only world that intersex people have is in the blogosphere. They are still in secrecy and shame. They are the most oppressed of all the sexually different people. And as Curtis Hinkle says, the fact that the binary sex system is a fiction is written in the bodies of intersex people. Now, intersex people have a combination of attributes we regard as male or female. And I'm going to tell you about just a couple of kinds. There's many different kinds of intersex people. I'm going to tell you about a kind of uh, intersex condition called androgen insensitivity syndrome. And here's that diagram you saw before. If the gene that codes for this receptor, which is a protein, if the recipe changes, why well, then the protein changes. If the protein changes, it may not work anymore, or it may work only partly. So the X means that the receptor isn't working. If it doesn't, excuse me, if it doesn't work at all, then it follows that the testosterone and the dihydrotestosterone will have no effect whatsoever. And based on what you've already learned, we would expect this individual to look like a female, okay? However, these people have a Y chromosome. They are genetically male. And the Y chromosome has an SRY region that works, so they have testes. Yeah, they have testes. And the testes secrete testosterone, a lot of it. But either the testosterone doesn't work or it works only partly. And because of that, the internal genitalia, the male internal genitalia, are not developed. However, that other hormone, the mullerian inhibiting substance, did get made and do, did work, so there are no female internal uh, genitalia. So these people have no internal reproductive genitalia at all. But uh, they do develop female secondary sex characteristics because the testosterone that's made during puberty gets turned into estrogen by an enzyme everybody has in their peripheral tissues. This is showing you all the many mutations that have been found for the G that codes for this androgen receptor. And here, look at these people. I ask you, are these men or women? Technically, these individuals are males because they have testes. But I also would claim these individuals are women. And furthermore, if they have complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, they always feel like women. Ah, they always feel like women. Now, if the androgen receptor kind of sort of works, then you will get, here's our typical male, here's what looks like a typical female. Well, you can be anywhere in between here. Here's someone where the urethra is opening on the underside of the penis. Here's a short penis and one opening for the urethra and uh, uh, and so on. Uh, here we can't tell whether we're looking at a scrotum or a labia. 
So these individuals right here have very ambiguous genitalia. And uh, this is the way people look when they have uh, partial androgen insensitivity syndrome. What's significant for today's purposes is you cannot predict the sexual identity these people will have when they grow up. Some of them will feel like females, some of them feel like males, and some of them feel like intersex people. Now those were genetic males that live as women. If you thought that male equals man, guess what? I don't think so. Now here's another condition. This is the most common intersex condition, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And it's uh, caused by a mutation in one of the genes that codes for an enzyme in this enzyme pathway. This enzyme pathway is found in your adrenal cortex and it turns cholesterol into hormones like cortisol. Uh, but if these enzymes like this one or this one doesn't work, then these steps can't happen and these molecules pile up and they get shunted in this direction and you, the adrenal cortex winds up making a lot of testosterone. And so people with congenital adrenal hyperplasia are making a lot of testosterone while they're fetuses and when they get born, they usually uh, have ambiguous genitalia. So here's a scale similar to what we saw earlier. That earlier scale was the Quigley scale for androgen insensitivity syndrome. This is the Prater scale for congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Here's a typical female, here's a typical male. And when, uh, females, XX people, with congenital adrenal hyperplasia can look like anybody that you see here from one through five. Look at five, and it's very much like a male, except this is the uterus hooked up to the urethra here. Mm-hmm. All right, and here are some pictures of ambiguous genitalia. This is the way many people with congenital adrenal hyperplasia look. And how do they feel about themselves? Well, let me, let me first show you that uh, this uh, condition is more common in certain ethnic groups, like it's very common among Jewish people. <clears throat> when I was in college, I had a friend with classical uh, CAH, which means they're born with um, ambiguous genitalia, OK? Uh, and another friend who had the non-classical type that's so common in Ashkenazi Jews. They, they're born with conventional genitalia, but they're making a lot of the male hormone throughout their lives, and they get steadily virilized throughout life. And this is what happened to these uh, babies uh, because of John Money. You see, there's his name, Money. Uh, and these two individuals probably started out looking much the same. One was made to look like a girl, the other made to look like a boy. Okay, and when we finally follow them up, you have to understand, this is most intersex people don't even know they're intersex. They've been lied to from day one, um, and there's been practically no studies on them. Um, and so the little bit that's been done has been done only recently. A lot of the work was done by Milton Diamond during the years that John Money was still uh, lying to the world. Uh, and uh, with uh, p women who with uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia have a higher rate of uh, tomboyishness and uh, lesbianism and uh, they may be less satisfied with being female. Now, of course, this represents a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the lesbian community, very tiny fraction, but this, uh, these results are consistent with the organization activation mechanism because these individuals were exposed to androgen uh, before birth and this should alter their brain and alter their behavior and that's exactly what we see. This is my friend Alex. I've gotten to know quite a few intersex people over the years and this is Alex who was born uh, with congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Uh, I'll just briefly tell you the story. The parents were told after Alex was born, you have a son. Two hours later they were told, you have a daughter. The doctor on his own without even telling the parents decided that Alex's clitoris was too big and hacked it off, and ever since, Alex's clitoris has been insensate. And Alex's identity, it turns out, is actually more male than female. And uh, you're carving up a turkey at my house last Thanksgiving, enjoying a joke, uh, has just undergone top surgery, and this coming weekend, we'll be visiting a surgeon to see if some of that scar tissue on that clitoris can be removed to restore some sensitivity. Yeah a life of depression, living on the margins of society, this is what I find with intersex people. <clears throat>